Okay, well, today uh, we're very honored uh, to be joined here at the Africa Center by a very good friend of the center, uh, Dr. Luca Biondeng, who is a senior, a senior researcher uh, associated with many institutions, including the University of Juba uh, in South Sudan, um, the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy uh, uh, at uh, the Kennedy School in Harvard, and the Prio Center in Oslo. Uh, Dr. Luca, you're very welcome. To so, I'm so delighted, actually, coming to the uh, African Center for the Strategic Studies and National Defense University is quite amazing. I'm so delighted being here. No, we're, we're happy. We're happy to have yeah, you. Yeah. So today we're going to have a discussion about the, um, the situation in South Sudan. Um, there's some optimism um, that the process, the peace process will begin to unfold as the government of national unity was sworn in yesterday, uh, which was a major part of, um, of the peace process. Uh, one of the things that happened in the crisis was the breakdown of the security sector. Uh, we saw the divisions of, you know, inside the army and the police. What are the priorities uh, moving forward? How might this security sector be brought back on track? I think the most important thing, the very fact that the choice of the people of South Sudan is to have peace agreement. And this peace agreement, it is the only option given the magnitude of the suffering inflicted by the, on the people of South Sudan in their lives and livelihoods. Uh, thousands of people died, and uh, even we don't know the number, which is also a, a disservice to the victims. Uh, but definitely in any, in any conflict, the, uh, the, the security sector is the one machinery waging the war, either between the warring parties, but even affecting the, uh, the communities. One of the good things about this peace agreement, the central thing is the uh, security sector reform. It is, I compare the, uh, this agreement with the comprehensive peace agreement. And it is one of the agreements that actually managed to detail out the, the, uh, how to, to, to effect the security sector reform. What we may need to know is, what we need to highlight is that one of the reasons that resulted in the eruption of this conflict, it started as a political conflict within the SPLM, a demand for democracy. And then the moment you have this crisis, political crisis, it ended up in the security sector. And because of the, this fragility is a result of the very fact that we did not have a very comprehensive security reform. So what happened is that you have a national army that should supposed to be in the process of modernization and, and transformation. So there were a lot of issues of integration, professionalism, and how to face the SPLM from a liberation army into a national army. And because of the, and the structure was in such a way it was so fluid. And that's why when there was a, this, this uh, conflict within the SPLM, uh, the political party, then the victim was the SPLM, the national army. And because it was along this ethnic line, there was no national agenda that you can forge the army to be a national, a national organization. It, 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 in a normal situation, it is like that you can have political difference, but should not affect the army. If the army is really well established to be a national army, many countries, in African countries, you get most, in most cases, the army is quite neutral in any political situation. But what happens in South is a reflection of how the security sector reform failed to build a national army a, a base on a national agenda rather than ethnic line. So what happened, SPLA as a national army started disintegrating along this ethnic line. And that's why the magnitude of the destruction that happened actually in the security sector. So, and, 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 and it is a top priority for peace and stability in, in, in South Sudan because there's a militarization of ethnic groups. So you have started ethnic groups taking, the, uh, taking the, uh, the violence as the machinery for them to defend themselves or to ally themselves with the, the warring parties. So you have, even the communities have been affected, leave alone the army. So we are seeing that the, the security sector reform is going to be actually the absolute importance and the top priority for this government. You have to get it right. What is happening now is that the militarization in the both parties, whether it is the SPLM in opposition, the number of the of the of the soldiers, the, the ranks increased substantially, and also even in the in the in the SPL in the government, and I think the most difficult thing is how can you what what could you do with the non-state security actors who fought the war and they believe they are part of it, and how can you build a national army that is actually going to be that can meet the 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 strategic and security interests of the South Sudan, 
And this is going to be a debate. How can you reflect this diversity in this the new a new state that we are going to have? So, so the agreement is very clear on this issue of security sector reform. And for me, is a top priority that the, the the new government should start right. embarking on it. Right. Now, you you made a very pertinent point mm. about how the political rupture. Yeah. Eventually affected. You eventually ended up spilling yeah. into the security sector. Yeah. And then the security sector then divided on uh, on ethnic lines. Yeah. So, um, in as much as uh, you know, security sector reform is absolutely important. Do you see uh, a corresponding political will on the part of the political actors to create an enabling political environment for that security sector reform uh, process uh, to begin to unfold? And, and and that's and exactly the point you raise is very important because the security the security sector it is expanded. It's not only those in uniform. And that's why the fragility of South Sudan is, is, is weak institutions. And, and this weak institution, it is, it is the, uh, the context that we should be. Because if the rules of the games are not set right, if, as I said, it will end up in the, in, the, uh, in the security sector. For example, if we are going to establish a government of national unity, this government of national unity, one of its primary objectives is to ensure that there's a, there is a rule of law. Because the monopoly of power is the primary, the, that's the core function of any government. But you have to have an institution that can be able to provide this. It's not only the, the police, the army, that can, it is, it is, a, it is, it is a holistic one. And that's, and, that's, and that's why the security sector reform will depend on the political reform and the, and the, and, and the reform within the government. For example, if, what type of government that we are going to have? If this government is going to build on consensus, make sure that you don't resort to violence. The, uh, the, the rules of the games are well. Have a democratic value that can govern the way, even if we are in conflict, we should be able, whether it is an executive or whether it is in, uh, in, in the parliament. And have an independent judiciary that can be able to resolve in case we have conflict in, this, in these institutions. So a rule of law that is based on, 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 on constitution and the law. And it is when we get this one right, the system of government itself, that is going to help so that the security sector reform cannot be a last resort for resolving conflict using the violence. Right. And, 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 and for example, I think it is that's the, the most important for the, for the people of Southern the government of national unity. Uh, if we don't reform the, uh, the institutions of government, and at the same time, the political party also, the SPLM, uh, because the political party, they need also to be reformed. So that they adhere also to the uh, to the democratic values, yes. and this institution. So cherishing these these reform on the basis of democratic values and not to go for violence will have a very important impact on the security sector. I mean, on the on the uh, on the security sector, and 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 the point you raise it is very important. That's why the link security sector to be a holistic approach yes. in, in 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 the in the civilian institution as well as the the uh, the military institutions is quite important. Yeah. Now during the. Um you know, very, very sad course of events uh, yeah. since 2013. One of the positive things that we've seen uh, in, this, in this crisis is the very active, very vibrant role of civil society, South Sudanese civil society, the academic institutions, the institutions from the University of Juba, um, you know, the networks, the law, the law society uh, of South Sudan, mm. working um, across ethnic lines, but also very interestingly linking up with civil society organizations in the East African region to try yeah. and play a role in Addis and to try and play a role in this in this in this process. What is the what would be the role of civil society moving forward from this point? Um, I think I think that's a very good point. You know, one of the things comparing peace agreement, this comprehensive peace agreement, the CPA and this agreement. One of the things is that you, you have these modern forces being part of the negotiations. And, uh, and the civil society, to tell you the truth, they have been quite effective, even during the negotiations, on, e on the pending issues, including issues that to do with security and issues issue to do with the, the, uh, the constitutional process, but even the system of governance. And they have been quite engaged in an informed way, the civil society. Uh, the good aspect of this peace agreement is that for the first time, that the civil society, they have been now represented in different the security sector architecture. There's a lot of oversight. There's a review. 
uh, defense and security reform uh, institutions that need to be established. And they put even civil society on those institutions. And that is for me is a very positive because people shifted away from looking at security sector as exclusively for the uniform, the people in uniform. And the good thing with that one is because the consciousness that has, has arisen in, in, in South Sudan, that the security sector reform is about the people. And for example, there are some organizations now that are quite going to be represented, uh, the civil society in, in this architecture for the security sector reform. And one of the good things that we have started doing is how to link the, the civil society with academia. And because, you know, civil society is not a method of uh, uh, reacting to what the government is doing. It is not an advocacy for the sake of crying out. I think crying out without a cause and without information is not healthy. And what we started to do, even when I, when being at the University of Juba, was to see whether we can link between the academia doing a research and this research to be tools that could be used by the uh, civil society in engaging with the civil so uh, with civilian as well as the government. So you have an informed engagement of the civil society based on research. And that link actually is very important. For example, one of the things we have been doing in the Juba University was to, 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 to dissect the agreement itself into its specific provisions and to be implementable. And what we said, let, let the civil society to be part of the monitoring of the implementation of peace agreement. Right. Because don't allow the, the, the parties, the warring parties, those who actually uh, they were fighting, to be the one monitoring themselves. The only, the only institution, the only sector that can have a higher moral ground is civil society. And what, by you, civil society, what you need to do, so what we did, we, we decided to dissect the agreement into different provisions, how it should be implemented, what are the indicators, and then gather this information, these academics, I mean the Center for Peace and Development Studies, to analyze those information, have a report, give this report to the, uh, to the civil society, and then they use it as advocacy tools. And we believe this is having, is strengthening the civil society in the, uh, in the next phase of the uh, implementation of peace agreement will be quite important. And this one is across, including the, the security sector reform. Uh, because we need to monitor it and to see to what level it's being implemented effectively. Right, right. So now that we're um, now at this uh, stage where, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the government, you know, the government of national unity has then, um, you know, has then been established, um, what are the prospects now uh, moving forward? You know, what are the prospects that um, the issues that led to the conflict in the first place will be, will be taken care of? Uh, and that South Sudan will begin to take the steps, the necessary steps, uh, to recover from this, from what has been a very traumatic, um, you know, two and a half uh, years of, of, uh, of war. We, we, did, we did, I think, some of the challenges I'm facing that the South will face in the implementation is the good, the political will of the parties. And I think this political will of of, of, of the parties to commit themselves to the peace agreement is paramount. Because the parties are entering to this peace agreement with their political calculation. Ahead of them, they have 2018 elections mm -hmm. are coming. Make your, your strategy now how best you can win that election. Of less of how you can serve the people of South Sudan. Mm -hmm. And we are aware, of, people should be aware about this one. And that is going to be a danger. And for me, election in most cases in Africa, elections are a recipe for violence and conflict, if it is not managed properly. Mm -hmm. I think it is more of, we should look at the institution for check and balance, rather than the legitimacy of people through election that can easily be manipulated. And also, uh, and that's why I believe the period set for the election, and even people should focus now building these institutions and check and balance. Because if you are going for election, for example, and the SPLM is the dominant party is going to, to win the election, then you are not going to have a very effective uh, oversight and a mechanism for check and balance. But if you build a civil society, build these institutions, these are quite effective for check and balance rather than, than an election that can bring us problems. So it's one thing that's commitment of the parties to the peace agreement. And this will necessitate that we need to engage the civil society so that they can be able to... to to, to be on board also to, let, to get this elite to be accountable. The second one is that 
most of the peace agreement, it is not only this current peace agreement, it is elites power sharing agreement. It is about a compromise how the elites will be able to, 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 to get a share in power. But it doesn't, but there's a lot of assumption in most of these power sharing agreement of elites that the followers have the same grievances and are represented by these elites in Juba. That may not necessarily reflect the fact that these, these, these followers, especially when you talk, talk about the youth, we have the wild army, we have Galwing, we have Arrow Boys. These are the youth that are actually being used by elites in fighting this war. Their grievances are quite different from the elites. And that's why even though you have this power sharing agreement, you should be mindful that there are some non-state security actors that are, are actually on the ground with the communities that may not necessarily be satisfied with this peace agreement. And that's why one of the things of this uh, security sector reform, that the monopoly of violence at the community level will largely be depending on these non-security state actors, because the state will be very far from the communities. And the youth will continue to play that role. And that's why we should recognize that fact, because we should have incremental and gradual um, integration of these forces, I mean, of these uh, security sector uh, forces. So this is going to be a very important, I mean, a very big challenge. The, the, the elites and the, the followers, especially those who fought the war. The, the other one is about the institutions. Uh, we, we made some work on the, uh, the, uh, what the impact of, of the conflict on the institutions, especially the security sector. You know there is this, um, the, uh, the, the World Bank, they have uh, indicators for the institutions and, and the quality of policies. Southern Sudan is the worst, because this score is up to the six. Southern Sudan is having the score of two. It's the worst in the sub-Saharan, poor, poor sub-Saharan Africa. Even the worst among the fragile countries in the world. So if you have these weak institutions and you want to build peace, I think you could see the big challenge. Because any efforts in order to build peace and then it's becoming so fragile, that is strengthening these institutions, it will be uh, uh, paramount importance rather than rushing for these, these elections. The, the, the last one is the political environment. I think the SPLM, there's a lot of debate that the SPLM, you know, for you to transition from war, from war of liberation to government is quite bumpy. And this is what is called the curse of liberation. Because then if you have weak institutions, then you have a problem that you, you will not be able to, to deliver for, especially the liberation movement. When they move from liberation to, to governing, they tend to, to fail because the mindset, the attitude of governing, of the liberation, is not with the same mindset that you can become and governing. And that's why most of the liberation movement, they, they will find it so difficult to govern. Because even they, because you have a certain structure, the command structure in liberation movement. Here you need to have consultation, you have a lot of... So it's difficult for them, and then they have this exclusive... Um, assumption that the, the, the legitimacy of any government for them because they fought the war. And nobody should even question them. And that transition is quite, is quite uh, difficult. So SPLM itself needs a lot of reform so that they become the, uh, to focus on the democratic change within the SPLM, not the military structure. And that, if you don't, you fix it. Because, you know, you cannot have democracy without politics. You cannot have politics without political parties. And these political parties, this is the essence of you to reform them. And as I see, the SPLM itself is going to be a big, uh, a big, a big, a big challenge for this, uh, for this government. So reform the political context. So security sector should be look in this, this, this bigger context of the. One of the biggest problems that we are going to face also the relationship between the first vice president and 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 the president, because we hope we could establish an informal network because they're bitter experience in the history. How can they work together? It is not through formal mechanism. It has been shown in many cases, informal network are even more important than formal network. So that they can forge a, 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 a working relationship and in their mind, the interests of the people of South Sudan. Mm. Well, um, this is uh, definitely um, many challenges, many strategic challenges. Um, you know, we're all very hopeful, very hopeful and uh, very supportive that, uh, you know, South Sudan will be able to, to meet many of these challenges. And, uh, you know, we'd just like to thank you very much, you know, for taking the time uh, to come here to discuss these issues um, with us. We hope that, uh, you know, you'll be able to, uh, to join us at some point uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, to continue the discussion. Uh, yeah. 
So for the benefit of, uh, of our uh, audience, uh, we've been speaking with, um, with uh, Dr. Luca Biongdeng. He is uh, an eminent um, Southern Sudanese uh, personality. Uh, he's been involved in, uh, in the peace process uh, for many, many years. And uh, he's a senior um, uh, associate uh, professor of a number of institutions, including the uh, Kennedy School of Government and the Prio Center in Oslo. Uh, Dr. Luca, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah.